Hello there! Welcome to No Extra Words, the flash fiction podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. It's funny, we have a a piece we're working on for my choir performances, which will be over by the time you hear this. Um, but we've been working on it since August, because when you are a musical person, you start prepping for Christmas in August. Actually, if you're a musical performer, you start prepping for Christmas in August. If you're a director, you start prepping for Christmas over the early summer, because you got to pick the music. But at any rate, we have this song, It's Beginning to Look a Lot Like Christmas, and it starts, it's beginning, it's beginning, it's beginning, which I really want to sing to you right now, and apparently just did, because it occurred to me, you're going to be hearing this in December, which right now feels really far away. But happy holidays from No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction podcast. We're doing something a little bit different with our kind of holiday break-in format this year. We're doing a series of reruns. So last episode, if you tuned in, you heard kind of the best of 2015. Uh, We picked a 2015 episode that epitomized what life was like on the show back then. And you got to hear it. And we are on to 2016 today. So same thing. I'm going to choose an episode from 2016, tell you why I chose it, and then tell you what I think of it now in the fall of 2017. So 2016 was a huge year for the show. We released episodes almost every week. I did June, July, and August. I did an every other week schedule just because of my own sanity. But other than that, it was weekly. And we also did seven specials over the course of that year. Four of those were our author interview specials that I did to coincide with Contributor Appreciation Month. Contributor Appreciation Month was something we tried in January 2016 to just honor people who had been on the show up to that time. So... It was a challenge. 2016 was the hardest year to pick an episode from because there are a lot to choose from. And I could have shared with you any number of things that happened over the course of that year. But I gravitated to this one for several reasons. First of all, a lot of the contributors on this particular episode are multi-episode contributors, people who are real friends of the show, who I know pretty well. And it's fun to kind of go back and hear their voices from earlier contributions to the show. Um, so Paul Beckman's one of the contributors to this episode. And I think this might be his first one with the show. I'd have to double check. May not be. But he's been with us a, a few times. And he is somebody I wanted to feature before I ever had a show. He was somebody I was a fan of when I first discovered what flash fiction was. And to have him submit really made me feel like I had arrived <laughs> as an editor. Um, it was actually a question. So the review review, which is a listing of literary journals who are kind enough to share a listing of us, do an editor question periodically where they'll send a little email out to editors on their mailing list and ask them some questions about what it's like to be an editor or what they're looking for, or various things. And then they put out little features on their blog that are editors answers to these questions so writers can read them. That's always a super fun thing to participate in. And one of the questions from a while back was, who's your big get? Like, who's your dream person? And I got to say, well, it was Paul Beckman. And then he submitted. So that was amazing. The actual true answer to that, I have to I have to have it aside for a second. Podcasters ask each other this question a lot. That sort of, who is your dream interview? You know, indie podcasters, a lot of whom have interview-based shows, will say, like, if you could interview anybody, who would it be? Would it be Oprah? Would it be you know, Madonna, like, who would it be? Um, And my answer 100% of the time is Neil Gaiman, and I don't do interviews. So Susan Vollenweider, friend of the show and fellow podcaster, said to me once, she said, so really what you need is Neil Gaiman to write a piece of flash fiction, and then you would air it. And I said to her, I said, any way that Neil Gaiman wants to be on the show, the invite is open. If Neil Gaiman wants to be interviewed, if Neil Gaiman wants to leave voicemail, if Neil Gaiman would like to come on and do a new style of poetry involving teaching turkeys to speak Spanish, Neil Gaiman is invited. So, Neil, if you're listening, or if anybody out there is listening and has any contact with Neil Gaiman at all, no extra words at gmail.com. Seriously, if you ever want to do anything experimental and you need a place to do it, or if you just want to say hi to your biggest fan, like, we're the place. So... That's an aside. That's always my answer. But the real world answer in terms of who did I really want to get that I thought I could get, one of them was Nancy Stolman, who was nice enough to share a piece when I contacted her out of the blue. And you heard that on the Microfiction Triumvirate episode that we re-aired last episode. And one with Paul Beckman, 
who sent me a piece of flash fiction and I got to accept it and I got to air it. And I think I've shared three of his pieces to date or something. So when that question came up, that was my answer is, yeah, I had a dream get and it was Paul Beckman and look at me go. Um, the truth of the matter is I have received so many really wonderful short story submissions from incredibly talented authors. The, the talent that I've been able to bring to you guys over two and a half years has just blown me away. So any list I could possibly have created has been surpassed and then some by the talent that we have discovered. And I like episode 51. It came right after our anniversary episode and it had just kind of a personality to it. It's called Curmudgeons and Incorrigibles because it had those kinds of characters. So I'm going to let you listen to it and then I'll be back when it's over to tell you what I now think. A note to the listeners, episode 51 contains some explicit language. Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. New Heart by Mitchell Krupmolnik Gorbaugh 1. I'm staying in the oldest Irish bar in the city. I come downstairs to get my bangers and mash from the kitchen and old bush mills from the bar. I still have IRA weapons in the trunk of my car. Jim McCallum is still trying to raise money to kill Orangemen. God saves the queen. She lives on and on. But hardly anyone dies these days. They just keep getting more ancient. One might wish for the death of the war criminal Dick Cheney. But it's like the weather. No one does anything about it. They even gave that fucker a new heart. Can you imagine? 2. While I'm drinking my whiskey, the barman hands me a letter from my ex-wife in America. I begin reading it immediately. She reports that she threw her violin into a rocky field. It wasn't the expensive one that she uses for concerts. Her audition trail ended with a job playing for the Nashville Symphony Orchestra. Soon it was too late to go elsewhere. She disliked the South and detested country music. Nashville seemed a tacky place to have a classical career. Her violin caught a gust of wind and flew much further than she'd expected. It landed among the dry remnants of blue and white wildflowers. She heard it hit against a rock. It wasn't an instrument she cared about. Other news? Her brother, an amateur beekeeper, had been attacked by a swarm of bees. His wife had contracted lupus and didn't have the energy to attend to his stings. The family's oldest daughter, just entering high school, was showing early signs of schizophrenia. Their basement had had a hidden leak— and now their cellar was filled with black mold, an aggravation to lupus. There was nothing my ex could do about the problems her brother and his family were having, so she threw her old violin into the field. I put down the letter, took a sip of whiskey, and pondered how I might respond to it. or DVD, by Daniel Maluka. The old man waddled towards the checkout. Hello, young man, he said as he looked at me, strangely. Hello, sir. How are you doing today? The man shook his head theatrically. Not doing well at all, young man. I moved the yogurt and scanned it. Oh, sorry about that, sir. What? You know what's wrong with the video store? He peeked up at me again. Eyes eager for a reply, still with the odd look. Was there something on my face? Um, the one down the street, um, what's it called again? Kenny's home video, he quipped snappily. I go into the video store, and guess what I see? In the value section, they mix them all. Mix what, sir? The DVDs, they mix them all. We get the DVDs and the Blu-rays all together in one bin. I have nothing against the blue... I mean, Blu-rays, but I enjoy DVDs more. I shouldn't have to wade through the litany of shitty Blu-rays to get to my DVDs. So you're for separating them, I asked? You gotta keep them separated, he began. That's the only way to restore order to the place. Look at the state of the place now. It looks half run down and no one goes in there anymore. And you think it's due to the mixture? 
the old man scoffed. Of course it's due to the mixing. They're like oil and water. The DVDs and the Blu-rays are opposite. I quickly scanned the milk and the breakfast sausages. He was now staring at me, not even bothering to glance away. What do you think, young man? I scanned the soap and looked around the store. It was rather late, so the geezer could afford to chew my ear off. What do I think? I asked as I ran up his total. Yes, you! That's why I asked. I don't think the fabric of our society will tear because of the mixing of DVDs and Blu-rays. The old man pondered that for a second. It's always been DVDs dominating. Aren't you scared of the blo- Blu-rays taking over? I was growing tired of the geezer now. I think life has changed, and I think your total is twenty-eight thirty-five. Cash or credit, I asked. He paid an exact change. Dean's Dilemma My friend Dean has no eyebrows. He has a full head of curly hair, has to shave, has some chest hair, but never got the eyebrow gene. It wouldn't be so bad if he was a plumber, an architect, or a gynecologist, but he's my dentist, and I feel I have a cartoon character as my dentist staring down at me with his eyebrowless face every six months. For his 10th anniversary in practice, I organized a group of his patient friends to chip in and get him a gift certificate for eyebrow plugs. What the hell do I need eyebrows for? What function do they serve? Feeling the pressure from his friends, he made an appointment and went, but we turned with eyebrows drawn on and a recommendation that he have them tattooed instead of plugs. You're a Jew. And Jews don't believe in tattoos, unless you're Adam Levine, I told them. Trying to make light of the subject and delaying the whole plug deal, Dean let his wife draw eyebrows on in different colors and sizes, such as red, white, and blue for Independence Day, blue and yellow for Hanukkah, and of course green and red for Christmas. One St. Patty's Day, four couples went out for corned beef and cabbage and green beers or green Grey Goose martinis. Dean went over his limit. His emerald green eyebrows drooped around his half-masked eyes, and he slapped the table and said, I have an announcement. I'm having the eyebrow plugs put in next week. He expected something, so we gave him a round of applause and he stood on a chair and took a bow and then dropped trow and mooned us. Did you notice there wasn't a hair on my ash, he slurred. They're waiting for me to come in and have them used as plugs. I've been going to New York every week to have some removed and stored, waiting for the right time, and that time is next week. As much as we cared for Dean, it was going to be a struggle looking at his ass hairs hanging above his eyes. He had no idea what he was in for when asked about his new eyebrows by patients not in on the down low. Hello there. Welcome to No Extra Words, the flash fiction podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. Curmudgeons and incorrigibles is what we're talking about today. I looked them both up in the dictionary, Merriam Webster, just because even with words you know, it's always fun to have that exact definition because there's nuances that you miss. A curmudgeon is a person, especially an old man, who is easily annoyed or angered and who often complains, whereas incorrigible is incapable of being corrected or amended, not reformable or manageable. I think both of those types make really, really cool characters. 
So we started with the curmudgeon section, although I think your guys early in this story are both, but we kind of started with this old man ruminates life section, um, first in New Heart, and then on to Blu-ray DVD, and then in Dean's Dilemma. One of the things that's cool about today's episode is we are welcoming back three repeat contributors, as well as welcoming first-time contributor Daniel Maluka. So the playing off of voices that we heard before and voices that are new to the show pretty cool. Incorrigible is a word that gets lifted right out of the story that we're going to close with. Before I do that, I'm going to quickly talk about the podcast. I said a couple of times in social media and on the blog in the last couple of weeks that it's been interesting to transition into this every other week schedule that we're doing for the summer. And I've kind of missed you guys, missed talking with you, missed bringing you new stuff. It is however opening up that time that I hope that it would. So hope you haven't missed us too much in the two weeks that we have been gone. One other thing that's going to open up some more time and help us kind of get out from being underwater a little bit is we are closed for submissions officially as of today. So if you have something you're dying to send us, you got to hold on to it till August when we will open up for those again. There is one grand exception. It took less than a week of us being on this new summer schedule before I decided to add stuff to it. So we are going to do another summer camp episode. Episode five was our summer camp episode, and we're expanding it this summer to make it the 2016 summer camp special, which is going to come out, I'm hoping, in July. But what that means we need your camp stories. And there are pretty specific rules about what those need to look like. So please check out noextrawords.wordpress.com for all of the details about that. So if you're looking to submit, send us a camp story or wait until August. And it's interesting because usually our submissions announcements, I always feel like clash with the content of the show. And I feel bad because it's my chance to talk to you. But I also want to deal with the meat of what we do, which is bring you short stories. However, I happen to have a story coming up next that is going to talk directly about writers and prose and submissions. That is The Party by Adam Kluger, featuring voice actor Aisha Walks. His prose? Wonderful. Pequot? Sentence structure, syntax, use of colloquialisms? The entire body of his work is chopped. A little hard to digest, but deliciously robust narrative nonetheless. You really have been spending a lot of time on your food blog, huh? Platform is everything these days, B. How are plans coming for tonight's get-together? Oh, you know, the usual drama and complaining, of course. It won't be a literary circle, even if someone wasn't bitching about someone or sticking the knife in somebody's back. It's all part of the fun and games, I suppose. You're part of the scene long enough, and nothing surprises you. These writers, though, continue to show even poorer taste, if I do say so. This last one couldn't have been any more impertinent, really. You shepherd them through the process. You offer them immortality and you give them a chance to be sampled by the true arbitraries of the literary intelligentsia and do you receive any form of gratitude from them whatsoever hardly i oh, know b they are truly the basest of all creatures all ego and no talent insecurity and hubris they grab and ploy and never once realize that they are not special in the slightest you're simply the current flavor of the month. Oh, this new one was the worst, I tell you. He thought he was born with a gift of some sort. You know the type. He has no time to play the game, as he would call it. No time for foolish submission guidelines or petty protocols. Can you imagine? Yes. He really did say that. Didn't he realize that those submission guidelines and protocols that he mocked were instituted centuries ago to keep out the dreck and unwashed masses who claim to be writers? If we did not maintain standards or a threshold, there would be nothing but a giant mud puddle of dung surrounded by flies. And by flies, you mean, of course, aspiring writers. Of course. So who shall we expect at tonight's heavenly soiree? Oh, all the usual suspects. The staff from Creative House, including the illustrious Madame B, and her devilish young ingenious, and all dressed in high fashion like Dorothy Parker clones, 
all the top literary lights, bloggers and bloggers, some glitterati, musical theatre friends, a surprise or two, expect the usual standing room only. Lovely, lovely. Are they all going to be pulling this <laughs> new fellow apart to get at him? Mm. There should be enough for him to go around. When last we spoke, he impressed me with his big personality. So, how do you handle the particulars? Per usual. He signed his rights over for us, for the novel, etc., etc., for the standard minor advance. Did you make him jump through hoops? Of course. And dance like a chicken with his head cut off? Naturally. And he didn't read the fine print on the contract? They never do. Do they? That's right. So eager they are for that small advance and for that sweet taste of fame. <clears throat> they never have time for contracts or submission guidelines or petty protocols. They never do. Even when it says very clearly in black and white. Upon the occasion of my death, all rights to my novel revert back to Basco and Wellington and Associates. Speaking of which, how's your famous writer Stu coming along? Should be the head of the party, as always. B, you are a cheeky devil. Thanks, old friend. Be a good fellow and pass me a fresh sprig of rosemary, will you? And could you toss the leftover metacarpals into the incinerator? I have a feeling he won't be needing them anymore. Quite right. You encourage the Lord Rascal you. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time. Hello there. This is present day Chris again. That was an interesting adventure, listening to that one. It was not what I was expecting. It was fun. It was really fun to hear, but not at all what I was expecting. You can tell the show's grown up a little bit since the last rerun we revisited. And yet it still feels a little bit wonky to me, which is good. It means we've grown since then. The subject matter I find really interesting in 2017 versus 2016. I think the leniency that we give old men for being old men has faded in the year and a half since that was recorded. And this is not a political show, so I don't want to get into that too much, but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, although I will be interested to see how it ends up. How will uh, an old man being an old man be viewed in five years? I will be watching to see how that comes to pass. I had a lovely patron in the library a couple weeks ago call me dear, which is very, very common and happens all the time. And I said to my husband when we got home, I said, I wonder if we are at an end of an era where that is a term of endearment that will be used and accepted. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just always interesting to reflect on moments when things change. So we are definitely having a societal moment where the subject matter is very interesting viewed through 2017 lens. That said, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And when I was dumped into the first story of this episode, it felt like it could very easily be 2017. And wow, things really haven't changed all that much in the way that we view our world, have they? The last story was an interesting take just because I would love to do an audio drama. That's a dream I have. Audio drama is one of those produced storytelling shows where people have parts and it's often told in a a serial format. They're a ton of fun to listen to. Just Google audio drama and you'll come up with a bunch of them. It is intensely difficult to produce. It's a lot of work. And that story probably comes the closest to audio drama we've ever had on this show. And so it was interesting to hear the two voices go back and forth. That story was directed by the writer, Adam Kluger, which, as, who, as was mentioned, is a regular contributor to the show. It was interesting to hear his choices and how he had those actors interpret his words. So that was an enjoyable experience. And that's a subject that I've often revisited over the course of this show. You've, we've heard lots of stories about writers being taken advantage of, writers being driven to madness by rejection letters. It is very common for writers to write about writing, but no one does it quite like Adam Kluger, that's for sure. 
That was the first story that Paul Beckman read himself. He's contributed before, as I said in our intro, but it was really fun to hear his voice. I also made myself laugh when I hear myself talking about trying to fit producing the show into my life and juggling that. Do I take one week or two week break? All of that kind of stuff. And throwing out another call for submissions, which is something I feel like I'm constantly doing is I'm constantly asking you all for more of your words, more of your feedback. So it was like listening to myself talk right now in many ways. That was a ton of fun. I do want to end with a call to you all for something from you before we go completely away. We are coming up, folks, on our 100th episode of the No Extra Words podcast. Today is 96. And so we will do 97 at Christmas time, and then the calendar page flips. And so we're looking at 100 being end of January, beginning of February. And I really want that to be a party where we celebrate writers and writing. And I would love to hear from you all about a writer who has touched your life. This can be anybody, somebody famous, somebody obscure, somebody you heard on this show, somebody who's your next door neighbor. Doesn't matter to me, a writer who has touched your life in some way. I would love to hear how and why and who. And as I said, back in episode 51, I usually have very, very specific rules about how I want things to come to me when I ask for submissions. I got no rules on this one. No extra words at gmail.com. Just send it to me. Send me an audio clip. Send me text. Send me whatever. Send me your thank you to writers and we'll have a great celebration of writers and writing in our 100th episode. I'm going to see you in two weeks where we revisit, say that three times fast, a favorite episode from 2017. In the meantime, I hope you're enjoying your frantic holiday preparation season and I will catch up with you soon here on No Extra Work.